And what you see is there are interesting things. You'll see we'll five launches later with the Great Wall, but there are places where there are almost no galaxies, and those places where there are very many galaxies together. And what you'll see is there looks to be a lot of galaxies and they tend to fade out. That's not because there aren't galaxies there, it's because for the small one meter diameter telescope that the Sloan is using, many galaxies are too faint to be detected with that telescope. So, you know, they just fade out and you only see the brighter galaxies. But you take each picture and you count out the galaxies and estimate the distance. And then, as the Earth rotates, you take a series of pictures across the sky, and you get a fan across the sky. If you put your telescope at a different angle, you get a different fan. And down here, you get a different fan, so depending on the location. So now I'll show you a little movie of what the, what the configuration looks like. Here you can see the fans directly. You can see where we've mapped and where we haven't mapped. And you can see there are voids, and there are regions where things come together and you see uh, a lot of structure. So this is the one I was pointing to. It's the great wall of galaxies. Here it looks like a great string, but we have other samples that tell us there's some action of a whole sheet of galaxies. And there's very many galaxies, probably in this sheet, because on the order of a million galaxies, certainly over hundreds of thousands. So one of the questions you have is, you know, how unusual is that kind of structure, you know, compared to other things. So not only do you have the question of where the galaxies come from, and we said from mechanical fluctuations, but now we have to say, do they have the patterns that we expect they should have, and how many things we see that are the way they should be, and are there some anomalies that don't agree with what we're saying? So we're, we're, we're doing the crime scene investigations, and now the same investigations, and trying to see There's another sky survey, this one digital sky survey was done primarily by, by people in North America. Uh, there was a European one, where, of a different telescope, and here's a slide through of that. Because we have this map of galaxies, but we have more information. We know when they're spiral, we know when they're elliptical, and we know what colors they are, because we take their spectrum. But you can see as you fly through it, you have this very complicated catalog, a 3D map, and you can fly, fly through it. Now, we're going at very high speed, and things don't look distorted because the mapping software doesn't do real push swing out and look back at the cluster as you can see it has the same basic geometry. Except for the limitation of the fact that longer and taking pictures. So you can see the fan shapes. It's just a series of cones being dragged across the sky. So this is the this is the two degree field view, which is now being turned into the six degree field view. And again you can see the evidence of that region, what I call the, the great wall sticking out in a different slice. But what you see there are voids, and then there are sort of other areas where there are, where there are many galaxies. So what it looks like is kind of like a soap bubble kind of an operation, but you'll see uh, a little later. Okay. So but that should end. So right now, just recently, we've released some new data. Sloan 3 has a big project called BOSS. Um, and it is making maps of the sky out to a greater distance. And you can see it also is selective about which galaxies it's following up on. Because not only do you map where it is, but you're actually going to measure the spectrum of each one. It takes a lot of extra time to measure the spectrum. So you limit what you can do. So what you see is two bands. You see a place where you see all the galaxies. And you see another place where there's a special effort to find galaxies out of this larger distance. And then a whole other big, big band where you're seeing a lot more samples at a much greater distance. And so you're doing that because you're trying to map out these spheres. And let me show you a picture of what this, what, what this outer sphere really is. So the inner sphere is mapped in fairly much detail I'm not showing you here. The outer sphere these things are especially selected in order to get things out at this extra distance. And out here, these are set by quasars. We think our galaxies are just turning on, and their nuclei are very active, and they put out very bright sources. They're so bright, you can see their light absorbed against the, the gas that has to perform the galaxy set. So when you measure their spectra, you get a sample of all the material in between, uh, and so you get this sort of 
version. So that explains why this has the span, the small band shape and the big band shape. It's the fact that eventually when this, this survey is done, it's doing about a million counts a year, and it's doing you know, 40,000 40, to 100,000 quasars a year, we will eventually have a very big sample, which could happen more years ago. And we'll, we'll have mapping out a lot further. But even while this is going on, uh, my colleagues and I uh, are working on what we call Big Boss, to be the largest spectrographic survey ever, not until they finish it, the new one comes along. So the one I'm showing you the pictures of is this little red part in here. That's what we saw the movies of, that was of the survey. What's going on now is the Boss survey, which is out of this red. And then Big Boss is going even further out. Use a much bigger telescope than what Boston uses, instead of a one meter or four meter diameter telescope, and measuring uh, 5,000 galaxies at a time so that you can get up to, to instead of having a million per year, you can get up to 5 million per year or even 10 million per year. So, this is part of the strategy to map the universe and successive spheres in order for us to see the time history see if it's behaving the way we thought it should. Now our other approach is to take the data we have from the right radiation, take those small variations, put them in our computer model, and then run simulations on how the universe develops over time. So I'm going to show the simplest uh, kind of a uh, simulation. And this one is just done on a laptop because it's only includes simply gravitation, gravitating particles. And what you will see, we will run through a couple times, is those tiny fluctuations of the part of thousand. If you simply wait for 13 billion years, gravity becomes important, and it causes the area that are slightly over dense to attract the material around them. You see little peaks forming. But then you see those peaks form together in networks. You can see the top of the screen. The problem with having the lights on is uh, you can't see the screen. If you look over there, you see much, much better uh, the smaller one. Anyway, so you see first peaks form, and then those peaks interconnect in the global power cosmic web. Think of it as a very dirty spider web. Now this simulation is very simple. So 1 plus z is the relative size of the universe today, compared to the size of the universe when I'm trying to get through. And uh, so you find the web. This is a particularly simple simulation. It only has particles interacting under gravity and uh, only goes up to uh, a size to which the accelerating expanse of the universe doesn't have a big impact. If you go to bigger sizes, the accelerating expansion of the universe begins to pull things apart. So nothing bigger than these things are going to form. Uh, you know, so the giant superclusters of galaxies you see are the biggest things that we think should exist in the universe today. We knew this period when the universe was expanding but slowing down in order for our large-scale structure to form on these complicated networks to form. Something like the Great Wall is uh, you know, just at the edge of what we think could form or not form. What we see. Okay, so now I'll show you a simulation that's more. The simulation I just showed you is effectively a simulation we'll call dark matter. That is a matter of complex gravity, but doesn't interact with light, doesn't do other things. If you just make this framework, we can add into it the ordinary matter, which has electrons and protons and neutrons, interacts fairly strongly with light through the electromagnetic force. And the light actually, light pressure keeps it from forming together just like it pushed the dust clouds around. It's not until later when the universe expands into a family that starts forming. But because it can interact with light and straight energy, it falls into these wells that are produced by the dark matter and collapses and eventually forms stars and galaxies. So in this next simulation, the dark matter is shown as white, even though it should be invisible, and the ordinary matter is shown as yellow. So what we're going to see is on a very large scale, it's very uniform. It's very uniform. Maybe you guys can see it better than I can. And as we zoom in, we find the filaments of the voids. This is a much larger simulation than the one I showed you before. And uh, you know, as you zoom in, the place where many filaments intersect 
is a region where you get many galaxies together, and the place where there's no moment, you see almost no galaxies at all. And this is a dynamic process, and we're showing you a snapshot. It's like uh, a spider web that has dew on it, and the dew is slowly rolling down to the intersection. And the, that dew happens to be the galaxies. Okay, so here is the Millennium Simulation with 10 billion particles. And the distance across the screen here is about 5 billion light years. And if we zoom in, you see the filaments and the voids. And we're going to eventually zoom in onto a region where many filaments come together. So you can see what it would be like if you lived in a giant cluster of galaxies instead of a little tiny group of galaxies. So we not only don't live in the center of our own galaxy, but our own galaxy is not in a big group of galaxies. It's just a major galaxy in a small group of galaxies. So we're zooming in. You see many filaments come together. And we keep zooming in. And eventually we'll get down to the region where you can see something, a couple of galaxies are probably close together as an Andromeda. But if we lived in this area, no matter where we looked at the sky, we would see big galaxies the way if you're in the southern hemisphere, you can see Andromeda out of the side of your eye. So they are in close, you saw Chimney and Light years. And as you zoom out, according to our simulations, you'll see the universe gets very uniform, but on a small scale, it's, it's, it's very complicated. So then, I'll show you the difference between making a map and seeing what it looks like, and being in the universe and flying through it. The white puppy stuff is the dark matter, and the yellow stuff is the ordinary matter collapsed to form galaxies burning the stars like our sun. So you see a white halo, and then you see the yellow stuff in the center, this glass in the center. It's just like when you take a map, the dirt goes to the bottom of the cup. You can think of ordinary matter as being the dirt in the cup, also the bottom of the you can also see being inside of the universe and driving around, it's interesting and pretty, but it's hard for you to get an idea of what's really going on. Okay, are you tired of driving around the universe? So we have a picture that we have these maps of the universe that we, when the universe is very young, and we can run our simulation in a small region like this and turn it into a very complicated region. <laughs> Like that, of all the filaments and voids, and at the intersection of the filaments, the clusters of galaxies, where sometimes the clusters will be a few hundred galaxies or a few thousand galaxies, only when there's many filaments intersecting, where you're getting up close to a million galaxies. So we can do many different kinds of simulations to get the history of the universe. And in general, if we start the early universe, it's very hot and very warm and very uniform. And as the universe expands and cools down, you start having structure forming, and then that structure gets sharper and sharper. So this is the relative size of the universe. This is how far you're going back in time, um, various distances. So you can see what's going on. Let me show you the picture without the label. So you can see how smooth it is in the early days, and then how it sharpens up. It gets sharper and sharper as time goes on. So this is relevant to our understanding. I'm going to show you two sets of maps. On the top, and the first one, is the COBE-DMR four-year data map with a model of the galaxy removed. And below that is a map of Earth with the same angular resolution uh, and sensitivity. And so what you can see is you can see all the continents. You can see Russia because it's big enough. But some, some places like Italy don't show up. And, uh, but you can see all the continents. So we've taken the whole sky and made it flat. You see here, we pretty much have discovered all the continents at the beginning of the universe. Now when you go to the W map resolution, you see much more detail. You see many more. Uh, you see the same features, but many additional features on top of that. 